So welcome everybody. This is Conversations with God, a book club for Humanities Team. We're reading chapter, or we're reading um, book three of Conversations with God. We're on chapter two, and uh, Nanette and uh, Christine and a whole bunch of the crew are down in Costa Rica having a meeting, and so I'm, uh, I'm on my own today. Uh, so as I'm reading, if there's any time that you want me to stop, if you want to have a conversation, just somebody just unmute yourself and, and uh, interrupt me. Because as, as you know, when I'm reading, I can't see you. So if you're raising your hand, <laughs> I'm not knowing it. Um, and there's nobody else like Nanette watching. So um, with that, is there anything anybody wants to say before we get started? I was just wondering, uh, Linda, whereabouts we are on the chapter. We just... so, so we're at the very beginning of chapter two. Oh, okay. Haven't, uh, haven't even said that yet. So that's, that's where we're going to start. Anything right. else? Okay. Um, one other thing I was just going to, to clarify, because I know people watch the recordings, uh, it seems uh, now, I've been doing this for a couple of weeks, it seems that at some point, fairly early on in the reading, my uh, throat will start to get scratchy and I'll have to stop and mute myself and take a couple of drinks. And that happens once or twice. And the reason I wanted to bring it up is that it's a very similar experience that I have when I'm going into meditation. And I just feel like what's happening as I'm reading is that uh, in some way uh, the divine power is seating itself in me when that's happening. It's like my physical struggle of allowing it in. Uh, and then once I let it in, then the rest of the reading goes smoothly. Um, so I just thought I would, I would mention that so everyone knows what's going on. So here we go, chapter two. Neil says, what does the past have to do with the future? And uh, just real quick, I'm going to just mute everybody so that we have a clean um, background. And then you'll just have to unmute yourself if you want to interrupt me. Okay, what does the past have to do with the future? When you know about the past, you can better know about all your future possibilities, your possible futures. You have come to me asking how to make your life work better. It will be useful for you to know how you got here to where you are today. I would speak to you of power and of strength and the difference between the two. And I would chat with you about this Satan figure you have invented, how and why you invented him and how you decided that your God was a he and not a she. I would speak to you of who I really am rather than you who you have said I am in your mythologies. I would describe to you my beingness in such a way that you will gladly replace the mythology with co the cosmology, the true cosmology of the universe and its relationship to me. I would have you know about life, how it works and why it works the way it works. This chapter is about all those things. When you see, know those things, then you can decide what you wish to discard of that which your race has created. For this third portion of our conversation, this third book is about building a newer world, creating a new reality. You have been living too long, my children, in a prison of your own device. It is time to set yourself free. You have imprisoned your five natural emotions, expressing them and turning them into very unnatural emotions, which have brought unhappiness, death, and destruction to your world. The model of behavior for centuries on this planet has been, do not indulge your emotions. If you're feeling grief, get over it. If you're feeling angry, stuff it. If you're feeling envious, be ashamed of it. If you're feeling fear, rise above it. If you're feeling love, control it, limit it, wait with it, run from it. Do whatever you have to do to stop from expressing it. Full out right here, right now. It's time to set yourself free. In truth, you have imprisoned your holy self, and it is time to set yourself free. 
I'm starting to get excited here. How do we start? When do we begin? Where do we begin? In our study of how it all got to be this way, let us go back to the time when your society reorganized itself. That is when man became the dominant species and then decided it was inappropriate to display emotions or in some cases to even have them. What do you mean when society reorganized itself? What are you talking about here? In an earlier part of your history, you lived on this planet in a matriarchal society. Then there was a shift and the patriarch emerged. When you made that shift, you moved away from expressing your emotions. You labeled it weak to do so. It was during that time that males also invented the devil and the masculine God. Males invented the devil? Yes. Satan was essentially a male invention. Ultimately, all of society went along with it. But the turning away from emotions and the invention of an evil one was all part of a male rebellion against the matriarchy, a period during which women ruled over everything from their emotions. They held all government posts, all religious positions of power, all places of influence in commerce, science, academia, and healing. Well, what power did men have? None. Men had to justify their existence, for they had very little importance beyond their ability to fertilize female eggs and move heavy objects. They were very much like worker bees and ants. They did the heavy physical labor and made sure that the children were produced and protected. It took men hundreds of years to find and create a larger place for themselves in the fabric of our society. Centuries passed before males were even allowed to participate in their clan's affairs, to have a voice or a vote in community decisions. They weren't considered by women to be intelligent enough to understand such matters. Boy, it's difficult to imagine any society that would actually prohibit one whole class of people from even voting simply based on gender. I sense your sense of humor about this. I really do. Shall I go on? Please. Centuries more passed before they could think of actually holding the positions of leadership for which they finally had the chance to vote. Other positions of influence and power within their culture were similarly denied them. When males finally obtained, oh, this is Neil now. When males finally obtained positions of authority within society, when they at last rose above their former place as baby makers and virtual physical slaves, it was to their credit that they did not ever turn those tables on women, but have always accorded females the respect, power, and influence that all humans deserve, regardless of gender. There's that humor again. Oh, I'm sorry, do I have the wrong planet? Let's get back to our narrative. But before we go on about the invention of the devil, Let's talk about power, because this, of course, is what the invention of Satan was all about. You're going to make the point now that men have had all the power in today's society, right? Let me jump ahead of you and tell you why I think this happened. You said that in the matriarchal period, men were very much like worker bees serving the queen bee. You said they did the difficult physical work and made sure that children were produced and protected. And I felt like saying, so what's changed? That's what they do now. And I'll bet that many men would probably say that not a great deal has changed, except that men have extracted the price for maintaining their thankless role. They do have more power. Actually, most of the power. Okay, most of the power. But the irony I see here is that both genders think that they are handling the thankless tasks while the other is having all the fun. Men resent the women who are attempting to take back some of their power because men say they'll be damned if they'll do all that they do for the culture and not at least have the power that it takes to do it. Women resent men keeping all the power, saying that they'll be damned if they'll continue doing for the culture what they do, and it still remains powerless, and still remain powerless. Well, you've analyzed it correctly. And both men and women are damned to repeat their own mistakes in an endless cycle of self-inflicted misery until one side or the other gets that life is not about power, but strength. 
and until both see that it's not about separation, but unity. For it is in the unity that inner strength exists and in the separation that it dissipates, leaving one feeling weak and powerless and hence struggling for power. I tell you this, heal the rift between you and the illusion of separation and you shall be delivered back to the source of your inner strength. That is where you will find true power, the power to do anything, the power to be anything, the power to have anything. For the power to create is derived from the inner strength that is, a, is produced through unity. This is the true relationship, the true of the relationship between you and your God just as, as it is remarkably true of the relationship between you and your fellow humans. Stop thinking of yourself as separate, and all that true power comes from the inner strength of unity is yours, as a worldwide society, as an individual part of the whole, to wield as you wish. Yet remember this, power comes from inner strength. Inner strength does not come from raw power. In this, most of the world has it backwards. Power without inner strength is an illusion. Inner strength without unity is a lie. A lie that has not served the race, but that has nevertheless deeply embedded itself into your race consciousness. For you think that inner strength comes from individuality and from separateness, and that is simply not so. Separation from God and from each other is the cause of all your dysfunction and suffering. Still, separation, I think that's a typo. Still, separation continues to masquerade as strength. And your politics, your economics, and even your religions have perpetrated the lie. The lie is the genesis of all wars and all class struggles that lead to war, of all animosity between races and gender, and of all the power struggles that lead to animosity, of all the personal traits and trials and tribulations, and all the internal struggles that lead to tribulations. Still, you cling to the lie tenaciously, no matter where you've seen it lead you, even as it has led you to your own destruction. Now, I tell you this, know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. There is no separation, not from each other, not from God, not from anything that is. This truth I will repeat over and over on these pages. This observation I will make again and again. Act as if you were separate from nothing and no one and you will heal your world tomorrow. This is the greatest secret of all time. It is the answer for which man has searched for millennia. It is the solution for which he has worked, the revelation for which he has prayed. Act as if you were separate from nothing and you heal the world. Understand that it is about power with not power over. Thank you. I, I got that. So getting back first, it was females who had power over males, and now it's the other way around. And males invented the devil in order to wrest this power away from the female tribe or clan leaders? Yes. They used fear because fear was the only tool they had. Again, not much has changed. Men do that to this day, sometimes even before it appeals to reason. Sometimes even before, before appeals to reason are tried, men use fear, particularly if they have the bigger men, the stronger men, or the bigger or stronger nation. Sometimes it seems actually ingrained in men. It seems cellular. Might is right. Strength is power. Yes. This has been the way since the overturn of the matriarchy. How did it get that way? 
That's what this short story history is all about. Then go on, please. What men have had to do to gain control during the matriarch period was not to convince women that men ought to be given more power over their lives, but to convince other men. Life was, after all, going smoothly, and there were worse ways men could have to get through the day than simply doing some physical work to make themselves valued and then have sex. So it was not easy for men who were powerless to convince other powerless men to seek for power until they discovered fear. Fear was the one thing women hadn't counted on. It began this fear with seeds of doubt sown by the most disgruntled among the males. These were usually the least desirable of the men, the unmuscled, the unadorned, and hence those whom women had paid the least attention. And I'll bet that was because this was so, their complaints were dis discounted as the ravings of rage born of sexual frustration. That's correct. Still, the gr disgruntled men had to use the only tool they had. So they sought to grow fear from the seeds of doubt. What if the women were wrong, they asked. What if their way of running the world wasn't the best? What if it was, in fact, leading the whole society, all of the race, into sure and certain annihilation? This was something many men could not imagine. After all, didn't women have a direct line to the goddess? Were they not, in fact, physical replicas of goddess? Was not the goddess good? Teaching, the teaching was so powerful, so pervasive, that men had no choice but to invent a devil, a Satan, who counteracted the unlimited goodness of the great mother imagined and worshiped by people of the matriarchy. How did they manage to convince anyone that the, there was such a thing as an evil one? Well, the one thing all of their society understood was the theory of the rotten apple. Even the women saw and knew from their experience that some children simply turned out bad, no matter what they did, especially, as everyone knew, the boy children who could not be controlled. So a myth was created. One day, the myth went, the great mother, the goddess of goddesses, brought forth a child who turned out to be not good. No matter what the mother tried, the child would not be good. Finally, he struggled from his mother for her very throne. This was too much even for a loving, forgiving mother. The boy was banished forever, but continued to show up in clever disguises and clever costumes, sometimes even posing as the great mother himself. This myth laid the bias for men to ask, how do we know the goddess we worship is the goddess at all? It could be the bad child, now grown up and wanting to fool us. By this device, men got other men to worry, then to be angry that women weren't taking their worries seriously, and then to rebel. The being you now call Satan was thus created. It was not difficult to create a myth about a bad child, and not difficult either to convince even the women of the clan of the possibility of the existence of such a creature. It was also not difficult getting anyone to accept that the bad one was male. Weren't the males inferior gender? This device was used to set up a mythological problem. If the bad child was male, if the evil one was masculine, who would there be to overpower him? Surely not a femi feminine goddess. For as the men cleverly, for said the men cleverly when it came to matters of wisdom and insight, of clarity and compassion, of planning and thinking, no one doubted fem feminine superiority. Yet in the matters of brute strength, was not a male needed? Previously in goddess mythology, males were merely consorts, companions to the females, who acted as servants and fulfilled their robust desire for lustful celebration of their goddess magnificence. But now a male was needed who could do more, a male who could protect the goddess and defeat the enemy. 
This transformation did not occur overnight, but across many years. Gradually, very gradually, societies began seeing the male consort as also the male protector in their spiritual mythologies. For now, there was someone to protect the goddess from such a protector as from such a protector was clearly needed. It's not a major leap from the male as protector to the male as equal partner, now standing alongside the goddess. The male was created, and for a while, gods and goddesses ruled mythology together. Then again, gradually, gods were given larger roles. The need for protection, for strength, began to supplant the need for wisdom and love. A new kind of love was born in these mythologies, a love which protects with brute force. But it was a love which also covets what it protects, which was jealous of the goddesses, which now did not simply serve their feminine lusts, but fought and died for them. Myths began to emerge of gods of enormous power, quarreling over, fighting for goddesses of unspeakable beauty. And so was born the jealous god. This is fascinating. Wait, we're coming to the end, but there's just a little more. It wasn't long before the jealousy of the gods extended not only to the goddesses, but to all creations in all realms. We had better love him, these jealous gods demanded, or no other god, or else. Since males were the most powerful species, and gods were the most powerful of males, there seemed little room for argument with this new mythology. Stories of those who did argue and lost began to emerge. The god of wrath was born. Soon, the whole idea of deity was subverted. Instead of being the source of love, it became the source of fear, all fear. A, modern, a model of love, which was largely feminine, the endlessly tolerant love of a mother for child, and yes, even of a woman for her not too bright, but after all useful man, was replaced by the jealous, wrathful love of a demanding, intolerant God who would brook no interference, allow no insolence, ignore no of offense. The smile of the amused goddess, experiencing limitless love and gently submitting to the laws of nature, was replaced by the stem countenance of the not-so-amused god, proclaiming power over the laws of nature and forevermore limiting love. This is the God you worship today, and that's how you got where you are now. Amazing and interesting, but what is the point of telling me all this? It's important for you to know you've made it all up. The idea that might is right or that power is strength was born in your male-created theological myths. The god of wrath and jealousy and anger was an imagining. Yet something you imagined for so long, it became real. Some of you still consider it real today. Yet it has nothing to do with ultimate reality or what's really going on here. And what is that? What's going on is that your soul yearns for the highest expression, experience of itself that it can imagine. It came here for that purpose, to realize itself, that is, make itself real in its experience. Then it discovered the pleasures of the flesh, not just sex, but all manner of pleasures. And as it indulged in these pleasures, it gradually forgot the pleasures of spirit. These two are pleasures, greater pleasures than the body could ever give you. But your soul forgot this. Okay, now we're getting away from all the history and back into something you've touched on before in this dialogue. Could you go over this again? Well, we're not really getting away from the history. We're tying everything in together. 
you see it's really quite simple the purpose of your soul its reason for coming into the body is to be and express who you really are the soul yearns to do this yearns to know itself and its own experience this yearning is to know is life seeking to be this is God choosing to express the God of your histories is not the God who really is that is the point your soul is the tool through which I express and experience myself doesn't that pretty much limit you to your experience it does unless it doesn't that's up to you you get to be the expression and the experience of me at whatever level you choose there have been those who have chosen very grand expressions there have been none higher than Jesus the Christ though there have been others who have been equally as high Christ is not the highest example he is not God made man Christ is the highest example he is simply not the only example to reach that highest state Christ is God made man he is simply not the only man made of God every man is God made man you are me expressing your present form yet don't worry about limiting me how about about how limited that makes me for I am not limited and never have been do you think that you are the only form that I've chosen do you think that you are the only creatures whom I've imbued with the in essence of me I tell you I am in every flower every rainbow every star in the heavens and everything and in and on every planet rotating around every star I'm the whisper of the wind the warmth of your Sun the incredibly in, the incredible individuality and the extraordinary perfection of every snowflake I'm the majesty in the soaring light flight of eagles and the innocence of the doe in the field the courage of the lions the wisdom of the ancient ones and I am not limited to the modes of expression seen on your planet alone you do not know who I am but only think you do yet think not that who I am is limited to you or that my divine essence this most Holy Spirit was given to you and you alone that would be an arrogant thought and a misformed one my beingness is in everything everything the allness is my expression the wholeness is my nature there is nothing that I am not and something I am not cannot be my purpose in creating you my blessed creatures was so that I might have an experience of myself as the creator of my own experience some people don't understand help us to all understand So the one aspect of God that only a very special creature could create was the aspect of myself as the creator I am NOT the God of your mythologies nor am I the goddess I am the creator that which creates yet I choose to know myself in my own experience just as I know my perfection of design through a snowflake my awesome beauty through a rose so too do I know my creative power through you to you I have given the ability to consciously create your experience which is the ability I have through you I can know every aspect of me the perfection of the snowflake the awesome beauty of the rose the courage of the lions the majesty of the Eagles all resides in you in you I have placed all of these things and one thing more the consciousness 
to be aware of it. Thus, have you become self-conscious? And thus, have you been given the greatest gift? For you have been aware of yourself being yourself, which, which is exactly what I am. I am myself aware of myself being myself. This is what I meant by the statement, I am that I am. You are that part of me, which is awareness experienced. And what you are experiencing and what I am experiencing through you is me creating me. I am in the continual act of creating myself. Does that mean that God is not a constant? Does that mean that you do not know what you're going to be in the next moment? How could I know? I haven't decided yet. Let me get this straight. I'm deciding all of this? Yes. You are me choosing to be me. You are me choosing to be what I am and choosing what I'm going to be. All of you collectively are creating that. You are doing it on an individual basis as each of you decides who you are and experiences that and you are doing it collectively as the co-creative collective being that you are. I am the collective experience of the lot of you. And you really don't know who you're going to be in the next moment. I was being lighthearted a moment ago. Of course I know. I already know all of your decisions. So I am who I am, who I have always been, and who I will always be. How can you know what I'm going to choose to be and have in the next moment, much less what the whole human race is going to choose? Simple. You've already done the choosing. Everything you've ever going to be, do, or have, you've already done. You're doing it right now. Do you see? There is no such thing as time. Yeah, this too we have discussed before. It's worth reviewing here. I'm going to pause for a moment and just check in with everybody. So what do you, uh, what do you think? It were, we've got 20 minutes left. Should I keep reading? Do you, does anybody want to talk about what we've got so far? I just feel validated by the readings that we've, you just did. I feel like a lot of the things that I've been trying to say to people in the past couple of weeks was just really validated by what Neil was saying right there. Beautiful. Yeah, I just, um, it's always funny. I find it interesting how we come to these book readings and it's like the right reading at right the right moment. So I don't know if anybody else is having those experiences. Yeah, I would agree, um, Brenna. I Exactly how I feel reading that. Um, I mean, it's basically like quantum physics, really, but it's just explaining it so well, isn't it? Yeah. Anybody else? No. I, I did not actually have something to say about the, the roles, the gender roles. Like um, you started out the chapter when Neil was talking about how like um, the power shift or the power struggle throughout the time. I just think it's really interesting and really like cool that right now I like do a lot of girly things and like one of my best and most favorable yummy moments of being human is being a mom and like doing like all the mom things that they're in entails. So I think it's cool that we're like in a place in time where we can do things without this like power struggle, but we could just do them because we enjoy them. Like we can do male or female things like 
in, in this time, there's a lot more freedom to just be what we want to be in, in our bodies. Or I work with a lot of youth that are transitioning. So it's like, it's really hard because there's like that struggle within themselves, like of going from male to female or female to male. Um, so it's just really cool that this is a time where people can really do or be whatever they want to be um, in whatever form at this moment in time. Yeah, I'm glad you brought the, uh, the male female thing up because what, I, what strikes me is we hear a lot now um, in different groups and from different light workers that what we're experiencing is this is the pendulum coming back shifting from away from this male dominated energy back into the feminine energy and um, it, it's interesting because in in God's description of of uh, what happened you know where it was originally all feminine and then the men kind of got into it and shifted it like my conversations with god have given me a completely different explanation of that and so it's it's interesting because as i'm reading what i'm finding is that you know i have one idea of how it happened and here's another idea of how it happened and even though they're really different that like underlying that there's some i can just feel like there's a commonality so i it's almost as if you know when each of us make our connection with god we have our own filters that stuff comes through and so it's like it's like it's different but it's not and i can't even put into words how that how that works but i'm i'm just really aware of this of this pendulum that everyone's talking about, about how we're coming back into a female energy and um you know and that and that that what we're living under right now is a very predominantly male and certainly very fearful energy i mean everything coming from the new administration is all about fear 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 we got to be afraid 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 and um and it seems like maybe that's just like the very last of it. Because it really, the, the energy that I'm picking up on is that masses of society are not buying into it. We're not going into a fearful place. We don't, we, we don't buy into it anymore. Okay, let me... Uh, I think Sorry, one more thing to add to that. Yeah, yeah, go. Um, I mean, because I also have a, a degree in evolution and uh, evolutionary anthropology. So, like, I understand it from, like, the evolutionary perspective of, like, what really, like, humans needed to take on certain roles to really, like, push through to the next moment and, like, evolve. So, I mean... I know that, like, I don't personally like the new administration. It's not, like, something that I personally agree with, and I'm not really feeling, like, the, the vibe of it all. But I just really have to, like, sit back and wonder if, if it's what, like, the moment or the earth or, like, what we need right now to, like, push the moment and the momentum forward to the next um, level. Um, it wouldn't personally be the way that I would have chosen to do it, but I can respect it for, like, what it is and not, like... Well, I get a little frustrated with it, but I mean, it's just, you know, looking at the whole of like how long humans have been here, it's like a really like blip on the like whole of the, the planet. So, and each moment had required a certain amount of um, something, grit or social structure in order for it to just work at that time. So... Okay, I'll go on. Uh, okay, so yes, so tell me how uh, how it works, how this works. So we're talking about time. Past, present, and future are concepts that you've constructed, realities that you've invented in order to create a context within which to frame your present experience. Otherwise, all of your our experiences would be overlapping they actually are overlapping that is happening at the same time you simply don't know this 
you've placed yourself in a perception, perception shell that blocks out the total reality. I've explained this in detail in book two. It might be good for you to reread that material in order to place what's being said here into context. The point I'm making here is that everything is happening at once, everything. So yes, I do know what I'm going to be and what I am and what I was. I know this always. This is always. That is always. And so you see, there is no way you can surprise me. Your story, the whole worldly drama, was created so that you could know who you are and in your own experience. It's also been designed to help you forget who you are so that you might remember who you are once again and create it. Because I, okay, this is Neil, because I can't create who I am if I am already experiencing who I am. I can't create being six feet tall if I'm already six feet tall. I'd have to be less than six feet tall or at least think that I am. Exactly. You understand it perfectly. And since it is the greatest desire of the soul, God, to experience itself as the creator, and since everything has already been created, we had no choice other than find a way to forget all about our creation. I'm amazed that we found a way. Trying to forget that we are all one and that the one of us, which we are as God, must be like trying to forget a pink elephant in the room. How could we be so mesmerized? Well, you've just touched on a secret question, secret reason for all of physical life. It is life in the physical which so mesmerized you, and so, and rightly so, because it is, after all, an extraordinary adventure. What we used here to help us forget is what some of you would call the pleasure principle. The highest nature of all pleasure is that aspect of pleasure which causes you to create who you really are in your experience right here, right now, and to recreate and recreate and recreate again who you are at the next highest level of magnificence. That is the highest pleasure of God. The lower nature of all pleasure is that part of pleasure which causes you to forget who you really are. Do not condemn the lower nature, for without it, you could not experience the higher. It's almost as if the pleasures of the flesh at first cause us to forget who we are and then become the very avenue through which we remember. Well, there you have it. You just said it. And the use of physical pleasure as an avenue to remembering who you are is achieved by rising up through the body, the basic energy of all life. This is the energy which you sometimes call sexual energy. And it is raised up along the inner column of your being until it reaches the area you call the third eye. This is the area just behind the forehead and slightly above the eyes. As you raise the energy, you cause it to course all through your body. It is like an inner orgasm. How is it done? How do you do that? You think it up. I mean that just as I said it. You literally think it up. The inner pathway of what you have called your chakras. Once the life energy is raised up repeatedly, one acquires a taste for this experience, just as one acquires a hunger for sex. The experience of the energy being raised is very sublime. It quickly becomes the experience most desired. Yet you never completely lose your hunger for the lowering of the energy, for the basic passions. Sorry, I just, oh. 
nor ought you try. For the higher cannot exist without the lower in your experience. As I have pointed out to you many times, once you get the higher, you must go back to the lower in order to experience again the pleasure of moving to the higher. This is the sacred rhythm of all life. You do this not only by moving the energy around inside your body, you do this by moving around the larger energy inside the body of God. You incarnate as lower forms and then you evolve into higher states of consciousness. You are simply raising the energy in the body of God. You are that energy. And when you arrive at the highest state, you experience it fully. Then you decide what next you choose to experience and where in the realm of relativity you choose to go in order to experience it. You may wish again, experience yourself becoming yourself. It is a grand experience indeed. And so you may start all over again on the cosmic wheel. Is that the same as the karmic wheel? No. There is no such thing as a karmic wheel. Not the way you've imagined it. Many of you have imagined that you are on not a wheel, but a treadmill in which you are working off the debts of past actions and trying valiantly not to incur any new ones. This is what some of you have called the karmic wheel. It is not so very different from a few of your Western theologies, for in both paradigms you are seen as the unworthy sinner seeking to gain the purity to move on to the next spiral spiritual level. The experience which I've described here, on the other hand, I'm calling the cosmic wheel because there is nothing of unworthiness, debt repayment, punishment, or purification. The cosmic wheel simply describes the ultimate reality or what you might call the cosmology of the universe. It is the cycle of life or what I sometimes term the process. It is a picture phase describing the no beginning and no end nature of things, the continually connected path to and from the all of everything on which the soul joyfully journeys without etern throughout eternity. It is the sacred rhythm of all life by which you move the energy of God. Wow. I've never had that all explained to me so simply. I don't think I've ever understood it all this clearly. Well, clarity is what brought you, is what you brought yourself here to experience. That is the purpose of this dialogue. So I'm glad that you're achieving that. In truth, there is no lower or higher place on the cosmic wheel. How can that be? It, it, it's a wheel, not a ladder. That's excellent. That's an excellent imagery and an excellent understanding. Therefore, condemn not that which you call lower, basic animal instincts of man, yet bless them honoring them as the path through which and by which you find your way back home. We've got seven minutes left. So I just wonder if we want to have any more discussion. Should I keep reading? Keep reading? Okay, just keep reading. This would relieve a lot of people of a lot of guilt around sex. It is why I have said, play, play, play with sex and all of life. Mix what you call the sacred with the sacrilegious. For until you see your altars as the ultimate place for love and your bedrooms as the ultimate place for worship, you see nothing at all. You think sex is separate from God? I tell you this, I am in your bedroom every night. So go ahead, mix what you call the profane and the profound. 
so that you can see that there is no difference and experience all as one. Then when you continue to evolve, you will not see yourself as letting go of sex, but of simply enjoying it at a higher level. For all life is sex. Synergistic energy exchange. And if you understand this about sex, you will understand this about everything in life. Even the end of life that you call death. At the moment of your death, you will not see yourself letting go of life, but simply enjoying it at a higher level. When at last you see there is no separation in God's world, that is, nothing which is not God, then at last you will let go of this invention of man, which you have called Satan. If Satan exists, he exists as every thought you ever had of separation from me. You cannot be separate from me, for I am all that is. Man invented the devil to scare people into doing what they wanted after the threat of separation from God if they did not. Condemnation being hurled into the everlasting fires of hell was the ultimate scare tactic. Yet now you need be afraid no more, for nothing can or ever will separate you from me. You and I are one. We cannot be anything else if I am what I am, all that is. Why then would I condemn myself? And how would I do it? How could I separate myself from myself when myself is all there is and there is nothing else? My purpose is to evolve, not condemn, to grow, not to die, to experience, not to fail to experience. My purpose is to be, not to cease to be. I have no way to separate myself from you or anything else. Hell is simply not knowing this. Salvation is knowing and understanding it completely. You are now saved. You needn't worry about what's going to happen to you after death anymore. Well, that's the end of chapter two. Such a beautiful chapter. It, it was, wasn't it? Let me unmute you. Ah. There you go. No, I just want to know, this meeting is, is just uh, once a week or there is a certain rhythm or, or just... You, you every, every Sunday morning at this time. Every Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. So, for example, next Sunday morning mm -hmm. and the afternoon for me. <laughs> My, or, yeah. <laughs> next Sunday afternoon uh, uh, would be the same, it would be the chapter three. Yes, we'll pick up right where we left off. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And hey, there is something I would like to know. I, I don't know, maybe if you can give me some orientation about uh, how can I create here in in, the, in this town in which I'm, I'm living now, some kind of group of discussion about conversation with God, there is some way I can uh, follow some steps to join people because I think that there is nobody here that know this book or few people. It, it's incredible. It's, it's an incredible book. It's unbelievable. <laughs> it's something I would like. <laughs> Uh, what I can do is I'll mention that to, I'll let Nanette know that you're interested and maybe she can, when she gets back from Costa Rica, um, maybe Ooh. humanities team, Nanette Kennedy, <laughs> hang on a second. Nanette is, is, is the, the one that's coordinating the evolution revolution. Uh, no, I, th I don't know who's doing evolution revolution, but I know that. She's actually, it is, it is Nanette on both? Okay, so I'll mention both of the things that you've asked about um, to her. I'll send her an email, the Portuguese and then um, a book club in, in uh, Brazil. 
Yes. You can see my email there. Uh, no, I'm going to send Nanette an email. And I'm sure she must know you because you're a part of the community, right? Yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm in, in the Evolution Revolution. Yeah. Yes. I was the number 5,000 because <laughs> the day I wish, wish I enter in the, in, the, in, the, in, in the page, it was right. There are, there are actually 4,999 4, 9, people. Great. So if I join now, it would be 5,000. And it was not. <laughs> so maybe uh, she will remember because of this number. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's in the recording too. So when she watches um, the recording, she'll ah, see. Okay. So yeah. let's, let's follow next steps. Interesting. Very interesting. Okay. okay. Well, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording then. Thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, we'll meet here again next week. And even if there's no reminder, I'll be here. So um, I look forward to seeing you all then. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Linda. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Okay. Do you want to stay on for a second? Just sure. One second? Sure. Okay. I mean, just because like we were having the phone thing going, and so I thought it might be better if we're seeing reactions. Yeah. And